most stories that you hear, most accounts, they have something at the end, the ending which settles the air, it uh, brings it all together, it's like a conclusion that could be understood, a, a sense of finality. The book of Jonah is very unique in the sense that we're left, in one sense we're hanging, um, but praise God, it, even God's hand is upon the book, we see that the last to speak is God, And he finishes the book with a question. And the question's not answered. What happens to Jonah? What happens to Nineveh is left in the air. But I want to make some attempt at answering that. Nineveh, of course, is a little bit more historically easier to answer. This little book is really about God and it's about us as we relate to God. There's some tremendous lessons within it and I've been amazed as I look through the book of Jonah. So let's turn to the book of Jonah chapter 4, just read the last three verses from verse 9. What a way to finish a book, Jonah chapter 4 verse 9. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the good? And he said, I do well to be angry, even under death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not laboured, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should, I not, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word we just pray for your enablement both for the speaker and the listeners lord it's our desire just to to linger in your presence and to appreciate who you are and as we look at scripture lord we can see you're a great and a merciful and a wondrous god lord we come perhaps many are tired they've had a a big day out and a a lunch here at the church and but we just pray for this time that it'll be relaxed but it'll also be pertinent to be around your word Lord, we do think of those with special needs. I again just pray for the Collins family at this time. Lord, for others with particular needs, we bring those before you also. We thank you now and we praise you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We know from history what happened immediately after Jonah's time because the Syria, the people of Nineveh, became stronger and greater than ever before. They expanded and their power expanded. They became the mightiest empire the world had ever seen at that time. In 1 verse 2, God calls Nineveh a great city. And it was, and it would become even greater in power and prestige and appearance. It became one of the architectural wonders of the world. And the more cities that Nineveh plundered, the greater it became and the richer it became. Nahum chapter 2 verse 9 says this take ye the spoil of silver take the spoil of gold for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture he's saying there was no end to the store of Nineveh Nineveh had become so rich and so powerful but only a generation after Jonah the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom So the very hills of Galilee where Jonah had grown up and Jonah had his ministry from was conquered by these people, the Assyrians. Why would God judge the northern kingdom and bring the people of Nineveh down upon them to slaughter them? 2 Kings chapter 17 For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, and the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And they set up images and groves in every high hill, and under every green tree. And there they burn incense in all the high places, as did the heathen, 
whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Oh, folks, they were doing the very things that Jonah came and warned the people of Nineveh about, and his own people are doing it and doing it in a great way. Have a look in Jonah 2 8. Jonah from the belly of the whale, the smelly belly, would say this They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. They that go into false idols, lying vanities, those things that are not true, forsake their own mercy. Oh, if Jonah had warned his own people about this, they may well have been saved. What a danger. If we start to follow other idols, if we start to to put our focus on that, we're actually forgetting the mercies of God. We're actually almost getting the mercies of God out of our reach. What a tremendous fear, what a tremendous danger that would be. God had warned the northern kingdom that disaster was coming, but the people didn't repent. The people of Nineveh repented, but their own people would not repent. 2 Kings 17 says this, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. Oh, folks, can you imagine what history would have meant if Jonah had lived to see it? Jonah had had wanted judgment to fall upon Nineveh, but judgment fell upon his own people because his own people were after other gods and secretly they were doing things and openly they were doing things. What a terrible thought. What a terrible thought for those in the south, the people of Judah, that would see this nation rise up and come to the north and and, uh, conquer the northern kingdom. But also they had the message of Jonah. They know that Jonah had gone to Assyria, to Nineveh. They know that Nineveh had repented and and then Nineveh's turned and it's grown, it's come back and it has attacked the northern kingdom and taken control out of them. How astounding is that? To know the message of Jonah and to see the fruit of that. That gives us something to think about. If God had taken mercy on Nineveh, yet knowing how cruel and how brutal Nineveh was going to be to his people, then where does that leave us? God's been merciful to us on Adelaide. When we look at the things happening in this city with the rainbow flags and they're talking of a rainbow walk in one of the squares in Adelaide and and the various wickedness that is about and God's having mercy on us. Might there be a time of judgment to come on us or... Melbourne or Sydney. Assyria would continue to grow and conquer the southern kingdom of Judah and then push to the heart of Egypt. But the prophet Nahum, living in the conquered Judah, would declare what God observed. This is Nahum 3.1. Nineveh was a bloody city full of lies and robbery. And then he goes on to talk about the people that she had conquered was being oppressed with this unceasing evil. God is raising the alarm how wicked Nineveh was. In chilling words, God would pronounce a verdict and a sentence on Nineveh. I will make thy grave because thou art vile. God has said, you're going to the grave, Nineveh, because you're vile. So Nineveh that was spared, Nineveh that listened to the story of to the appeal of Jonah, had a death sentence. You'll go into the grave. You've crossed the line. You're wicked beyond belief. You've, you've heard it and you've turned your backs. In the middle of the 7th century, only a few generations after Jonah, Assyria suddenly began to weaken and it happened quicker and quicker than the other nations built up around her and came in and Nineveh was burnt to the ground, never to rise again. The end of Nineveh. Jonah's story is unique among the prophets. 
There's more about this man here in the book of Jonah than there is his message. His message was a simple, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Some writers think that he put it into that prophetic voice and a high wailing sort of a voice and just went through the city and that's all that he said. Because he didn't really want them to repent. He really didn't want them to turn to God because he knew that God would forgive them. There's a call to repent. Nineveh, sorry, Jonah was like many other of the prophets. He would, there was a call to repent, but Jonah went to a Gentile nation of Nineveh, whereas the other prophets would go to their own people. Jonah's call was a simple, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But many of the other prophets had a lot more of God's heart in there, the wailing of God and the, the, the grief of God and the pleadings from a, a loving heart. We can see some of that loving heart in the book of Jonah. Have a look in 4.4. 4. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? And Jonah's just sort of said, Lord, I knew what you were like. I knew that you're gracious. Take my life. I want to die. I don't want to serve you anymore. I don't want to be on this earth. And it's almost gentle. The Lord says, Doest thou well to be angry? We see the same heart of God in Isaiah 1. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be a willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. There's a sense where God is pleading. You know, do you do well to be angry, Jonah? Look, though your sins be as scarlet, I can have you back. And there's a heart of God that you and I know. He's, he's, he's patient with us. Jeremiah, we're familiar with the story, goes to the potter's house. He sees the potter making the the clay pots and, and uh, every now and then he'll make one up and, and it won't work out and he'll take it aside and then remake it and, and the lesson comes through that God can do with the nations and go, as he can do with us but in particularly there he can do with the nations as he pleases and if God wants to forgive a nation whether it's Nineveh he can forgive them if God wants to bring down judgment he can bring judgment down upon it Oh, just this morning we heard <clears throat> talking about what was happening in Wales and, and um, Pastor David Hill has been across to Wales and would say how there's so many churches that are empty. The buildings are empty and, and it brings grief to my heart because you read about the Welsh revival and the great things that God has done and a generation later and they've lost it, it's dead. And that can so easily happen in our generation. If we lose the plot, if we don't remain faithful, if we don't have a, heart, a fire in our heart for the things of the Lord, the next generation will be even more lukewarm and there won't be our churches in the land and we mosques and, and um, witches' covens and, and so forth all through the land. But Jeremiah looked at the, the potter's house and God can do these things. God can have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Why don't we call out to him? Why aren't we a people that are pleading with the Lord for his working upon the land? Do you remember when God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and then he put his hands over his eyes that so he passed past him and <coughs> he allowed him to see some of the, the afterglow as God left? God then said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will so and it will show mercy. Oh, folks, Jonah knew this. Just as Jeremiah knew it from the, the potter's wheel illustration. But he didn't grasp it. That so God could be merciful. That you could, under, you could almost come to God and know that God would turn and, and be merciful. Our Lord Jesus told a parable with the same sort of principle in it, and we often we, we have trouble understanding it. A worker goes out, he's owner of a vineyard, and he goes out, and, and it's going to be a hot day, and he gets people from the, the marketplace early in the morning, and they all come out to work from their work all day. But later in the morning, he gets a few more, and then early in the afternoon, he gets a few more, and, and then at the end of the day, he gets a few more. Then he wants to get his job finished, and he's a good worker, and uh, sorry, he's a good uh, vineyard owner. Well, the next at the end of the day, he's going to pay them all. So he pays 
the ones that were there from the very early morning their full amount. He gives them a good wage. Then those that come a bit later, he gives them the same wage. And those that had come that only worked an hour or so and they hadn't worked very long and they hadn't worked through the heat of the day, he gave them exactly the same. And the, the, the people there, the workers that had been there early, said, this isn't fair. I mean, if, if you, we have worked all day. And yes, we've got what, we've, what we bargained for, but why are you being so generous to them? Why be so generous? We, they haven't worked like us. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave the answer and said this, Is it not lawful for me to do this is the only, Lord Jesus Christ said what the owner would say. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? He's saying, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Why should you be jealous if I want to be generous? We do that with God. Sometimes we're asking ourselves the question, God, we've been faithful all these years. I've been serving in the church and I've done this and but these people, why are you blessing them? Why, why are you blessing them more than me? And we sort of compare ourselves and there's our first mistake. God can be generous to them if he wants to be. And he can be generous to these people. Who are we to say who, who God blesses and who God gives a hard time? Because God does. Sometimes the, the hardship that God gives us is a blessing in disguise and we don't always understand that. The stories and the lessons, sorry, not the stories, but the lesson of Jonah comes through over and over again. We don't compare ourselves. Um, there are parallels with the book of Joel. The book of Jonah is about 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Joel says there's a deadline as well. He says it's at hand or it's very, very near. Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and its destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Folks, may we never forget that all through scripture there's been this thought of an imminent judgment. And you and I are living in an age where we must, we never forget the return of the Lord may be near. It's imminent. It could happen at any time. And many look at the signs today around them. They look at what's happening in Europe. They look at Europe's changing over, over the last few weeks with hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to to go through into various countries, make their way through to Germany. And we know that that's, that's happening in such a broad way and, and we know that um, uh, a lot of reports have come out of how Syria, with the fall of Gaddafi, and how many of the IS had, had got into Syria and now they're fleeing with all the others back into the southern parts of Italy and Europe. And, and uh, there's this, the, Europe's changing. The world is changing. We look in the scriptures and, we, and it talks about... Um, especially during the tribulation, there'll be beheadings. And all of those that love the Lord, you know, the punishment will be beheadings. And, and all of a sudden, in the last few years, we look at IS and marching these men down in their yellowy orange suits down to the beach to behead them. And, and scripture's real. May we not lose the sense of the imminency of the rapture that the Lord could return at any time. And he'll, be, he'll come down and, and wait in the clouds and, and call out there'll be a command and he'll snatch us up to be with him because then he wants to pour out wrath as this world has not seen. Joel spoke about the time of the Lord is at hand and it's near. May we never forget that. May we never forget the sense of that the Lord can, what the Lord can do. We read here in the book of uh, Jonah, Look at Jonah 3.9. The king of Nineveh says something that is a classic. He says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Who can tell if God will turn? Let's call out to God. Let's plead with God. Who can tell if he will not turn and answer us? Joel 2.14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? There's a sense, why aren't we calling out to God? Who knows? God might answer us in a wonderful way. Joel goes on, And rend your hearts and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So we've already read that of 
exodus of, of Moses and his eyes being covered and knowing that God is gracious and merciful. And we read that in Joel. And we read that here of, of Jonah, that he knows that God is like this and he's rebelling against it. Have we grasped that? Have we grasped the fact of the goodness of God? That God will be with you no matter what, that he's a good God. That we could turn and turn to him. So why didn't the people of the southern kingdom that knew their God turn before they were conquered, before they were slaughtered and taken into captivity? Why would they hang on to those false idols? Why would they go and worship under the groves and under the trees and secretly do things that they know? Why do we do secretly do things that we know would be offensive to God, that we know that would hurt our faith? What happened to Jonah? Did Jonah learn his lesson. Did he ever learn to submit to God no matter what? Well, I'm just going to suggest something. You can argue with me. Perhaps he did. Because we believe that Jonah was the writer of this book or else if he wasn't the writer, he was the, the major source because of so many things that only he would know. Only he would know his prayer inside the fish. Only he would know of his conversation out with God outside of Nineveh and, and God's reply to him. All right, you're a thinking group of people. How would Jonah have known about the sailor's reaction after he's already in the drink about to be swallowed up by the fish? Have a look in Jonah 1, 15, 16 and 17. Jonah 1. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. How did Jonah know that to write that? Verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Is that a, a problem, I wonder? One writer believes that Jonah, before this account, was a well-known prophet. He had done marvellously speaking with the northern kingdom. And when he would have come back, everybody would have known the story of the fish of being swallowed by the fish. They would have known that he's gone to Assyria and they feel certain that any of those sailors that would have said, what's happened to this man that we threw overboard? I wonder how many of the sailors saw the fish. They thought, how many times would they return to Joppa? Maybe they asked about him. Who was this man that we threw overboard? This particular writer thought, well, it would not only be logical, but it would be quite likely that many of those sailors would have said, what happened to the man? Is this the same man? And perhaps when they've come back, they have even gone to look him up to see if he's the same man or an imposter. Was this the man that we threw overboard in the middle of a storm and then the storm went still? Yes, it is. That would be totally likely. Totally likely. But there's another option I don't have a problem with saying that the Holy Spirit urged Jonah to write that down as fact in doing so. Because you see, God was there. God knows what happened. And God can inspire that to be written. Just as we see Moses appears writing the first five books, has taken a lot of the documents that's already there and he's recorded it. But I'm sure God that's supervising that and inspiring that would make sure everything was chronologically right and and in writing the details and perhaps of the things that God has put in there, those gaps. God does that. This is a book that's inspired of God. This is a great book. If those sailors had caught up with Jonah and, and uh, spoken with him, then I'm sure their, their stories would have, would have correlated, it would have fitted in, and, and those sailors would have said, no, it didn't happen like that. It didn't happen like that. Some people think, well, this is not likely to be Jonah because it wouldn't be natural to put yourself down as he's put himself down in this. Jonah's shown his ugly side. He's showing his own anger. He's shown he's been angry with God and, and he's shown that he's a runner. He's a bit of a coward. He's running away. And Would he have done that? But if Jonah had really learned his lesson, 
if he'd really come to see his own anger and he's got the graciousness of God first hand, then what better way to publicly acknowledge that and those wrong attitudes and actions than to write it down simply as we have it today in a very simple, straightforward manner. I've no doubt of that all the facts of this story and the way that it's been put together was prepared by God. Because it's, it's, it's so profound. There's so many uh, the greats through it. There's so many li- literal... Um, I was going to say, in the literature, there's so many things that are beautiful. It's like a well-crafted story. There's no doubt that, that God's hand is upon it. Jonah gets no glory in this story. None at all. And God gets all the glory. Jonah gives the bare bones of the story, but it, it's so deep. There's just so many. We've, we've had about 11 messages on this, and I'm sure that uh, many preachers could, could do many more. It, there's just so much in this simple little story. I've already said that Jonah was a successful prophet, but now he's portrayed as a, a runaway, and, a, and the book closes with an angry, frustrated prophet facing God's gracious interrogation. Finally, the Bible's last word on Jonah isn't seen in the book of Jonah. It'll come out in the Gospels with our Lord Jesus Christ himself who will speak about it. Twice in Matthew and once in Luke, we see the religious leaders coming to ask our Lord Jesus for a sign of who he is. They want Lord Jesus to do a miracle or some sign, something that will impress them. And you and I know well his reply to that. He wasn't going to give them any sign but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah? You and I know what Jonah was like. You know the way Jonah reacted. Yes, the prophet Jonah. Three days. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth didn't make sense when he first said that but when after his resurrection and after the three days in the tomb the disciples would see it our Lord Jesus Christ declared that the religious leaders at the time at his time I should say um, would be condemned by the people of Nineveh and they would rise up at the judgment and condemn them because they repented We're talking about the people of Nineveh as as a real people. And yet the Jews would not. The Jews had someone vastly greater than Jonah preaching. They had God in the flesh. But they hadn't seen it. They hadn't appreciated it. What excuse could those Jews have for not repenting? Someone much stronger, much greater than Jonah was here and they didn't understand it. They didn't even recognise the heart of God in their midst. God sent Jonah as a messenger to sinful Nineveh and God shows his boundless grace and his faithfulness. But hundreds of years later, God would send another messenger to sinful mankind. This one went willingly and joyfully because he knew the heart of God. He was the heart of God. He could be called the Word because he himself was God's message. He was the message himself. He was everything that God wanted to say to the world was wrapped up in who he was, wrapped up in his person. And this messenger, instead of wanting to run away, almost we could say ran towards his enemies, who for the joy that was set before him, he would come and for us, for his enemies, you and I. This new messenger fully understood that his destiny was to die, but as I said, but for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross so that his enemies, and folks, I'll say it again, you and I might know life. Like Jonah, thrown overboard as a, a sacrifice, this new messenger 
would be a sacrifice so that other lives could be saved. This new messenger, like Jonah, would spend three days in utter darkness. And from this utter darkness, this messenger went on a mission from there that he wanted to do. Not like Jonah, because he had to. When God's mercy was shown to Jonah and his enemies, Jonah was exceedingly angry. But the new messenger was a happy extension of God's mercy to his enemies. He had the all of gladness. He was glad to go for the people that he would save. He was glad to be on a mission for God. He's glad for us. He's happy for us. Jonah is all about self-protection, but this new messenger is all about joyful self-sacrifice to win us. Who, for the joy that was set before him of winning a people to himself, his, his bride, endured the cross and three days in the tomb and the shame and is now set down at the right hand of the Father. I wonder whether you've seen all through the book of Jonah the Lord Jesus Christ because he's on every page, portrayed in different ways. This is our saviour. We have so much to be thankful for. Let's pray.